All right, guys. So we're going to go over anterior glenohumeral dislocation. This is the most common way that someone's going to dislocate their shoulder. Sometimes we'll see it dislocate inferiorly or posteriorly, but like seven times out of 10, it's going to be an anterior glenohumeral dislocation. So this is the most important um, dislocation to be aware of when it comes to the NPTE. So let's get into it. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the shoulder. So this is the most important thing to be aware of is where are we having an injury? So the injury is gonna to be to the anterior part of the capsule, which is this big circular area right here. So what are some structures that are injured? We can see that the tendon of the supraspinatus is gonna to be torn. So that's one of the big, you know, our big rotator cuff muscles that we're gonna see having problems. So if there's any sort of problems with rotator cuff muscles being torn with an anterior glenohumeral dislocation, it will be the supraspinatus muscle. And again, the supraspinatus muscle is the most common rotator cuff tendon to be torn in any sort of injury, not just this one. Um, we're going to see some of the ligaments in the anterior part of the capsule be torn. So these glenohumeral ligaments definitely are going to be a little bit messed up. Uh, this, uh, the subscapularis might also have some problems as well. Definitely the supraspinatus muscle, like most commonly is going to be uh, torn, but super subscapularis muscle can also be torn as well. We might see some biceps involvement with the biceps tendon. Again, we might see some glenohumeral labrum involvement as well in the form of maybe a slap tear as well. So remember that superior labrum anterior to posterior we might see a tear that way as well. So just being aware of that, um, there can be also this thing called a Bankart's lesion uh, that is a lesion to the glenoid itself. So we could see that as well. Again, all of these are going to um, demonstrate a positive apprehension sign when you go into external rotation and into abduction and then into extension. So like think of the motion you will make to throw a ball. That is going to be what is going to cause an increase in pain because these are all of the sort of ligaments and muscles that could be torn. Again, the coracohemoral ligament could be also torn a little bit as well, but these are the most common areas to be torn. If we just look at what's going on in the front of the capsule, all of those have a chance of being torn. So that's kind of what's going on within the anatomy associated with this. So Again, what is the most common reason why somebody would have an anterior glenohumeral dislocation? It is with the baseball throwing the injury. So we can see he's in abduction, external rotation, and into extension. He hit all three. That puts a lot of pressure on the anterior part of the capsule. So if you are sitting here, grab the side of your shoulder, palpate where like your uh, greater tubercle is kind of area if you want to like get the lesser tubercle in there too. So find kind of essentially where the um, peak of the humerus is almost to the humeral head because we can't really get in that. And I want you to abduct your shoulder. You can feel it's pushing out. External rotation, you can push it out. And then if you go into extension, it's really pushing out. You can see your shoulder starting to come forward. That is because there's so much pressure on the anterior capsule of the shoulder that that's going to cause the shoulder to dislocate. So throwing injuries, most common. So softball, football, baseball, baseball, probably the most common one. You're going to see a question. It's going to say baseball player. If you see baseball players start thinking this, either this or a UCL tear. So ulnar collateral ligament. Those are the most common that injuries that happen with baseball. So just kind of be aware if you're putting yourself in that position, we're having a risk of uh, trauma to the anterior capsule of the shoulder. Um, any sort of trauma to the shoulder itself could should be could be like a hit in football, hit from behind, your shoulder pops out kind of thing. Checked in basketball, your shoulder kind of pops out. Something like that could be a fall as well. That could also just fall back like that. Um, people have dislocated their shoulder from a car accident, so a motor vehicle accident, uh, something along those lines. Those would all be considered traumatic glenohumeral dislocations. And that's important to note because the non-traumatic would be our individuals younger than around 18 to 25, having a sports injury from that throwing. That is a non-traumatic injury because traumatic means that something else hit you. Non, or, yeah, traumatic means something else hit you. Non-traumatic means you did it to yourself you did it to yourself. So thinking like non-traumatic injuries with like an ACL tear, the pivot shift and stuff like that. Anything that you did it to yourself, that's non-traumatic. Traumatic would be something else did this to you. So either the ground, a car, another person ran into you. Those would all be considered traumatic. So if you see a non-traumatic anterior shoulder dislocation, it is going to be somebody throwing a ball. Like nine times out of 10, it's gonna be somebody throwing a ball. Traumatic would be hit from behind, 
fall something like think of an elderly person falling on their back and something like that pushing the shoulder forward that's what's going on so anything that's going to cause that pushing out of the shoulder forward that is what it's going to cause it so again baseball just think baseball with this one that'll make your life easier what does it look like so i have like a picture there was a lot of pictures online of people's shoulders popping out every sort of which way but this one specifically shows anterior dislocation if it's a inferior dislocation you'll see that shelf deformity where it's like all of a sudden their shoulder drops off and it's like one shoulder is like way lower than the other can also be associated with an anterior glenohumeral dislocation we can also see that instead of their shoulder being square on the side it kind of turns into almost a triangle kind of shape and just looks funky like, it's like wait a minute and like this is something you can see from across the room like if you're looking at someone you're like yep there that's not in that's not in and so we'll see that they'll have a positive apprehension test which means if we try to put the patient into like external rotation uh, that abduction position. Essentially, if we try to put them in the position that caused the dislocation, they're going to be like, ow, crap, please stop. They're going to have a positive sign. Remember, positive signs are pain or any sort of weird shifting clunk kind of thing. Usually with these, you can just look at it and you're like, yep, that's what it is. We're going to send them to the ER. So you'll see the visible deformity that the humeral head is literally popping out and you can palpate it and you can see it. And it's kind of gross looking. Um, and the patient might be in slight abduction and um, maybe even external rotation, but most of the time they'll be in this protective, you know, like think of our patients right after they got a, um, oh crap, uh, rotator cuff repair surgery and they're in the abductor brace and that's a really protective position, uh, the sling position as I like to call it, they're like holding their arm in, like they're protecting it in this little baby um, that is what's good, the position they're going to be in because it's going to hurt to do anything else. This is a safe position for the arm. It likes to be there. You'll see them in this position. Um, another thing that we need to be aware of, and like, obviously they're gonna have pain and loss of range of motion. They're not gonna be able to move it. It's gonna hurt like crazy because their shoulder literally popped out. Um, the things that we have to be careful about, and this is why we do not reduce these injuries. Reducing means putting it back in place. We as PTAs or even PTs do not have this within our scope of practice. We need to send them to the ER for a professional to handle this. Um, patient might try to put it back in themselves and we're like, uh, not good. So with this, the reason why is because they could have diminished pulses because it could be dislocated and it's pressing on like the brachial artery or the radial, um, into the radial, uh, not the radial artery into, um, oh crap, I forgot the name of the other one, but the artery, the main one, yeah, the main, main one is going to be the brachial artery. It could be pressing on that, which then that goes all the way down to like the radial ulnar arteries and everything into the forearm and hand. So we'll be able to palpate. Remember, we palpate our wrist for the radial pulse and we might feel diminished pulses if we can palpate inside of the brachial artery to try to find that somewhere in here. Depends on the person, how chunky their arm is. My arm's a little chunky. I can't find mine, but um we would feel diminished pulses and diminished pulses means that there's somewhere upstream where it's being blocked, which could be the shoulder itself. So what we don't want to do is try to put it back in and uh, rip the artery open. So we don't do that. We let somebody else do that. Who's more professional than us. Uh, no, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want any part of that. It's I'd already, this is one of the things that like grosses me out dislocations. Um, the other thing is decreased sensation because it could be pressing on either the axillary nerve, the radial nerve, or the musculocutaneous nerve, probably musculocutaneous that runs down the front of the arm. Um, and so that is why we got to be careful with this because they could have decreased sensation, decreased pulses. And this is why they need immediate medical attention to reduce this, get it back in place. And then we can move on because we don't want lack of nerves and blood working. That's bad. So again, things that we have to be aware of. As I said before, once the patient has been stabilized and the dislocation has been reduced, which is not our scope of practice, we send this person to the ER, then we can work with them. The biggest thing for treating an anterior glenohumeral dislocation when it comes to a patient is do not under any circumstances put this patient into any sort of pec stretch. I'm talking like supine pec stretch, doorway stretch, corner of the wall stretch, any sort of come all the way out like this, external rotation stuff. No, no, bad. Don't do it because that's just putting them in the position that they could like redislocate. That anterior capsule is super weak right now. Got to let it heal. Got to let it get back in place. We do not want to do any movements that are going to push on the front of that capsule because it go pop right out. We don't want that. We don't want any part of that. I do not want to have somebody dislocate their arm under my care. I do not want to do that paperwork. I do not want that on my license. You do not want that either. It is dangerous. We could hurt an artery, vein, 
um, nerve, something like that. Don't do that. Once we have this patient in our care, what we want to do is focus on stability. Stability is the primary thing for anything that's been dislocated, out of sorts, not staying in place, anything that's like popping out, not doing what it's supposed to, all wiggly wobbly and stuff like that. The biggest thing we want to focus on, if it's a list of things to treat the patient, boom, 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 boom. The one that says stability should be the one you hone in on. It won't always be the case, but step like nine times out of 10, focus on stability with this patient because this patient is already super, super unstable. They're prone to more instability injuries. We want to make sure we stabilize them as much as possible, strengthening the rotator cuff muscles mainly because those are the main muscles of stabilization in the shoulder. Once we get our range of motion back and we're not aggressively stretching, especially into external rotation abduction, we are just, you know, gentle range of motion, get us back within our normal limits and stuff like that. Then we'll work on strengthening and then we'll work on our stability and everything, all our stabilization exercises. So we want to make sure stability is like the biggest thing. So stabilize, 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 stabilize with our patients who have any sort of dislocation. That is like the gold standard for helping these patients to avoid this happening again. Another thing is telling the patient, stop doing that. Stop giving yourself into some crazy wind up throw or something like that. Uh, if this person has multiple dislocations anteriorly, they may need to stop doing this sport because they're just going to keep hurting themselves. It's not worth it in the long run to lose complete use of your arm or like have ischemia to the rest of your arm because you want to throw. That is a separate conversation, but activity modification is the biggest thing. Making sure you're not getting into those crazy positions that are going to increase the stress to the anterior capsule. Again, we're not putting any interventions where we're putting them in a pec stretch or anything like that because that's just going to put more on the capsule. Think of the arthrokinematics of the joint. As we go into external rotation, the shoulder pushes forward. The humeral head pushes forward on the anterior part of the capsule. As we go into extension, the humeral head also pushes forward on there. We don't want to put them in those positions. Those are like the two positions to avoid. And then if you combine that with abduction, you're screwing yourself over. Not good. Not good. An emphasis on when it happens one time, you are more at risk for it to happen again. Like you're 50% more likely for it to happen again. I forget the exact number. It's somewhere around there, but for every dislocation you have, the chances of having another one exponentially increase as we go along, because we're just weakening the front of the capsule. So no pec stretching, stability is the number one thing and activity modification. Maybe we're doing some postural re-education exercises to help pull everything back and keep the pressure from the anterior part of the shoulder, you know, just keep them like, keeping ourselves all back and not punch forward or pushing this on the anterior capsule. We don't want that. So key words when you're looking at this specific pathology, throwing injury, baseball, softball, football, any like quarterback throwing, anybody throwing, overhead athlete, tennis, anything where you're doing that motion of the abduction, the external rotation and the extension, bad, bad, high risk for um, anterior glenohumeral dislocation. And I'm saying bad, like in a way of like, when you're thinking of this pathology, think about it, you can throw what you want, you're fine. Just remember this, this is a potential thing that could cause a risk for injury. Trauma from posterior to anterior. So anything like hitting the back, pushing everything forward. Like if you're thinking anterior dis glenohumeral dislocation, use your body. You can, you can move your arm around and stuff, just as long as you're not like getting into your neighbor's cubby and like cubicle and stuff during the exam. Use your arm, do the motions, be like, ah. Oh. I see. Bad. So any sort of trauma from posterior anterior, think like a fall, uh, like old person falls on their back, pushes it forward. Not good. Anterior apprehension test. So again, let's just move into abduction, external rotation, push it on the front of the shoulder. Patient doesn't like that. They say, ow, they grimace. They don't look good. They're like, please stop. Or they like swat you away. Those are all the things that will indicate problems. So don't do that. Um, any sort of visible deformity at the shoulder itself will also indicate that. So that's our picture of our glenohumeral head, our head, our head of the humerus popping out. Not good. So any sort of visible deformity at the shoulder is going to indicate, okay, bad. Somebody dislocated their shoulder. Not good. We can see that if the board's describing this, you're also like, oh, not good. Deformities mean something's out of place. Not good. Any answer that says increase stability in the shoulder, 10 out of 10 answer. Anything that you can think of that's going to help decrease any sort of instability in the shoulder, increase stability, strengthen the rotator cuff muscles, 
all of that mumbo jumbo. We like those answers, especially when it's like, what's an appropriate intervention or what's the most appropriate? We like it. And no, pectoralis major stretching, no stretching into this position, external rotation, anything that stretches the pecs with this condition, no, bad, just put no. Unless it's saying, which one of these is not appropriate? Then we would click that answer because we don't want to do this with this condition. No, bad. Pec stretching, bad. No, bad. All right, guys, sample question. A physical therapist assistant is treating a baseball player with a right anterior shoulder dislocation. The patient exhibits five out of five strength in their right shoulder, possesses active range of motion within normal limits. However, continues to exhibit a positive response with the anterior shoulder apprehension test. What would be the most appropriate intervention for this patient at this time? One, chest to ground push-ups. Two, doorway stretch. Three, shoulder taps in a high plank. Or four, standing shoulder abduction with five pound weights. So I'll give you guys a second to think about this question. All right, good guys, so the answer is shoulder taps and a high plank because this is a stability exercise. We're working on, you know, high plank is when we have the arms fully extended, we're doing one tap, one tap. This is working on stability in the shoulder because we're working on maintaining a position while we work on some balance and proprioception. So this is a great stability exercise. This is really gonna help the patient um, because you can clearly see that where they're still having some apprehension, which means they have some continued instability in the shoulder. That is what the positive anterior shoulder apprehension test means. They have instability in the shoulder. So what do we do? We stabilize the instability. Chest to ground pushups, way too much pressure on the anterior capsule. We're going all the way down to the ground. So much pressure on the anterior capsule, bad, no, not good, not appropriate. Maybe to like 90 degrees would be okay within a workable range, or at least to the point, like I like to say anybody with shoulder issues when I coach CrossFit or anything like that, we just go to like 90. We don't want to go too far down to where it pushes forward, just through our available range, modify the range. That's okay. Chest to ground pushups, way too much range, pushing on the anterior capsule. No good. Doorway stretch is like the number one. Don't do this. Don't do this. You see a picture of somebody doing this on the boards. Don't do it. Bad. No, no, no. Great anterior apprehension and anterior glenohumeral dislocation. Bad. No. Yeet that one out the way. Shoulder taps and high plank. I already talked about why that's the answer. The reason why number four is not the right answer is because they already have five out of five strength in their shoulder. They don't need to strengthen anymore. They need stability. We got the range of motion within normal limits. We got the strength within normal limits. We're working on stability. So while that could still be an exercise that we do with this patient, the most appropriate for this patient where they're at at this time to return them to sport and activity without pain is stability. All right, guys. I hope that this was helpful and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care.